This is Kavaivai Nona Kukuna, Treasure of Our Ancestors, the 2022 Virtual Summit and Workshops. Normalizing Hawaiian Culture on TV with Kamakapili. This is Friday, March 4th, 2022. This session will go from 10.30 till 12. All right, looks like we're present and accounted for mahalo, mahalo. I am so looking forward to sharing this time with you today. And now that I have taken the time to take care of our housekeeping, I am so, so happy to have this moment to introduce a young gentleman that I've had the pleasure of knowing for many years. He is my hula brother and a genuine charismatic cultural advocate. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our presenter today, Kamaka Pili. Mahalo. Mahalo, aloha. Aloha mai kako, mai kalahi ki that's all the Hawaiian I can think on the top of my head. So I'm going to finish this off in English. Aloha. <laughs> um, there is a particular reason why I wanted to start that way. But I first and foremost just want to um, mahalo everybody. Mahalo to Uluvehi and Kehaulani for having me uh, as part of this conference and this program. I'm very honored to be here. Um, I want to just throw out some of my own little um, advisories that I had given the request to both Ulvehi and Kehaulani. I have a tendency of going off topic quite frequent, so hopefully I can stay focused on this um, and share a little bit about my story. And I, I got to just first and foremost say that I'm very fortunate and blessed to be in the space and, and, and stand in the opportunities that I stand in to be able to contribute to Hawaiian culture and, and normalizing that in some sense on, on TV. Um, I think a lot of it really comes down to really my personal journey and I think my um, my approach to Hawaiian culture. And that has really changed over the years from a, a small kid um, going through then high school and college and then more into my adulthood and, and to where I stand now. Um, and I, I give a big mahalo to every single stepping stone I've stepped in and stepped on throughout the process because if it wasn't for those stones and, and those mentors of mine and my kumu and kupuna that I've been able to build relationships with and talk story over the years, um, if it wasn't for all of them, I wouldn't have this opportunity again. So thank you. Um, and for those who may be on here, then I'm sorry, I don't know who exactly is on here. If you're one of those, I'm, I'm sure that um, you, you're, you know that you have been an influence on my life. Um, as a kid, I have kind of was, I'm born and raised in Kailua. Um, that can kind of, to some people, share a little bit about my background. <laughs> um, Kailua has been an ever-evolving space, and it's one of those love-hate relationships. And I think, um, aside from that, when it comes to that, it really comes down to the tourism. And it's kind of gotten to uh, become that tourism has been that love-hate relationship for me, but that's kind of been the main fuel to um, fuel me to do what I've been doing. Uh, throughout all the projects that I do, even till today, there's many different demographics you can speak towards, especially being on the news, you have a, a wider range of audience. But for me, my main demographic has always been our island visitors, um, because I felt that it's the island visitors who travel back home around the globe and they're the ones who share the stories of their experiences here the stories they've heard and it's through their stories that they're speaking to their friends and family across the globe in my mind that's like a little a rock dropped in a pool and then this ripple effect just continues to just grow and grow and to me that ripple effect is the perspective and and the stories of Hawaii and I just always felt that maybe the visitors as they go back home and the stories they share is it the most authentic is it the most accurate um and and a lot of times they're not even stories told from our own people they're stories shared through commercial and and you know things that are set up to be a visitor destination or experience and a lot of times that's not our people so i wanted to find a way how can we bring out the stories from our own people and have those be the stories that are then taken back home with our uh, island visitors after they finish their trip here and those are the stories that they tell their friends and family and that's the perspective of Hawaii that we want to be shared so that's always kind of been the driving force um, in the back of my mind um, growing up as a kid being from Kailua I wasn't really a, a heavily influenced from Hawaiian culture it was more just how I always kind of interpret it was kind of a local boy 
you know, there's there's some Hawaiian things that I was familiar with and a lot of things that I wasn't um, in terms of, you know, more generically surfing. Um, I'm not a big fan of fishing because I don't have much of that patience to just wait and sit. <laughs> but I've always tagged along with my family who would, I mean, in, in just that kind of a general sense, taking care of the yard. And um, so to a, a very minimal level, I felt. Um, went in Chanty Lakes Elementary School, Kailua Intermediate School, so public school growing up. And I remember the Hawaiian education within that system was very small. In Hawaiian, uh, in elementary, I, I believe it was either fourth grade, I think it was, that we had a kupuna who would show up like once a month or once every few weeks or so to spend like an hour with us and um, made a program. And aside from that, I think that's pretty much the extent of the Hawaiian exposure in terms of culture in elementary school. And in intermediate school, there really wasn't um, that I can remember. It was mainly just getting through it, you know, and, and just kind of finding yourself as a student and as, as um, you know, where you, 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 where you fit in life. But that cultural presence for me really wasn't there. Um, I was just so fortunate that I had the opportunity um, to get into Kamehameha schools for my ninth grade. And, and that was uh, my high school experience and, and closed off my, my educational journey. And I'm very grateful um, because one, I think I tried like five, four or five times and I didn't make it. <laughs> so if, if we were, if I had failed once more, then that was it. My parents were like, okay, you're going Kailua or you're going St. Francis or something. And I can only now imagine what kind of a person I would have become, not saying it would have been any less better than who I am now. But if I did go to Kailua High School or if I did go to St. Francis, because that's where my mom and her family went, who would I have turned out to be? And would I be standing in the space that I'm standing in now? I probably not, especially if I went to Kailua. Um, but nonetheless, I, I had the very fortunate blessing to get into Kamehameha schools. And just to be quite frank, actually, as, as I'm just talking the story, I hated it. <laughs> Freshman year, I hated it. I wanted to leave and I wanted to get out of it. It was such a different experience. And it was more just a shell shock because I, I didn't really have too much friends when I went there. And I just felt so alone. And, and I told that to my mom and she just told me, um, stay in it until you get to song contest. And then once song contest is power, if you still feel the way you feel, then fine, we'll leave and you can go back to wherever I was going to go to. Fortunately, song contest came about and I loved it. And I don't know exactly what it was, but I think when you stand in that space of song contest, and despite the fact we're just standing on the, on the, on the, you know, on our seats and we're in this arena, for some reason, I just felt that was the most Hawaiian I've ever felt. And I don't know if it's, you know, I, I mean, now I can understand why, because it's all that stories and it's the passion and it's the love and it's all that that drive, I think, that everybody has that they want to share with everybody else. It's kind of just like compacted in one space. And I guess it's it was like an overwhelming thing that for me, it was that trigger that I was, it, it just made me realize like, this is beautiful. And I can't sing, so that's not beautiful. But the fact that I'm trying, <laughs> the fact that, that that what I'm singing about is is perpetuating this story but it's really it was the now that i look back it was really that journey getting to song contest and then song contest being that that space that you finally see what you was working so hard for and it may be we were working our, on our own particular song but then you look at all the other classes and, and the time that they spent, the love that they've gained for the stories that they've learned. And then their whole passion was to share it with us and vice versa. Our whole passion was to share it with everybody else. So I felt to me that was just kind of a sense of, I really don't know. I can't really put my finger on it, but it was between just being so exposed to what I was never really exposed to. Like I, I, when it comes to Hawaiian music, I've always loved Hawaiian music, but I'm really bad when it comes to music because I don't really listen to the words. I kind of just la di da with the tone. Um, so when I had that opportunity to really sit down and dive deep and break down what we're talking about, what we're reading, then you're really realizing the, the plethora of knowledge that stands right in front of your face. It just really comes down to the time and the effort and the decision that you make to learn it. And then what do you do then when you learn it, you know? Um, anyway, so song contest was one thing that kept me into school. And that really was the lifeline for me to where I'm at now, because it then from that point through my sophomore year, which I got into dancing hula, that was the first time I've ever danced hula before, aside from um, 
you know, made a program in elementary school, which was just sitting on the ground and tapping the ipu. <laughs> but when I got into Hawaiian Ensemble my, my sophomore year, that was a really big game changer because before that, growing up, dancing hula was always the joke. You know, um, kumu hula, marry this, was always the joke. And it was just like, in, in the space that I was gr growing up, men didn't dance hula. And that, that conversation was always around me growing up. So then when I actually had the chance to step in and dance, it, it was scary for me because I didn't, you know, I was going against of what I've always just heard around. And I just, I just felt like, yeah, guys don't dance with us. So when I got into it and I seen all my friends dancing, I think that was the reason why I took the chance to do it was because I had a bunch of friends who were doing it. They asked me to, to jump in. Um, it was, I wasn't Hawaiian Ensemble, actually. It was the Ho'ike First Song Contest my sophomore year. And then from doing that, which I loved, there was just some type of connection within me that it was just like, God, this is, I've never done this before, but this clicks. I fortunately got into Hawaiian Ensemble my junior and senior year. And that was really, for me, the foundation of Hawaiian culture. Um, because that was where I really started to dive deep in. And it wasn't then just learning, but then it was a way how for me to be able to express those stories that I'm learning. And I never realized how passionate I would have then fell in love with hula and using that as a means of expressing myself, but also as a means of learning who I am and, and where I come from. Um, there's many different ways that I see people do that. And hula has, has been that opportunity for me to do that. And it really, again, is just the foundation that I started to build on. I got out of high school that I um, fortunately got into Uichilo. And then that just was the water that, that fed this seed that planted in high school that started to have this beautiful sprout, started to peek through and, and then start to grow. And I got a mahalo uluvehi because she was part of that journey for me during that time. Um, when I, I was dancing with uh, Taupori Tangoro, who he probably doesn't know the impact that he has on my life, um, but he had a great impact on, on giving me a whole different perspective and a whole different, really a whole different set of glasses to look through when we're looking towards Hawaii and what does it mean and what is, what is there. And I've learned so much things throughout that process from um, not just dancing, but then you realize when you start dancing hula, all the other aspects that come with it, learning about your space, learning about the aina that you live in, learning how to utilize the aina um, in, in, in your benefit, in, in this sense would be for our implements and, and what have you. Um, but through that process kind of stems off its own little tangents. And after I graduated from college, I came back home, but then I didn't really know what to do. And I applied for a bunch of different jobs. I ended up just with a degree in batch, a bachelor's degree in political science. I ended up working at the dishwasher <laughs> at Bubba Gum's restaurant. Um, it was frustrating, but then at the same time, I, I continued my passions that I, I grew throughout that journey at UH Hilo. I, I just started to get myself into different cultural programs. Um, Lomi Lomi was, was the next thing. And I started to go to Lomi school while I was going and I was working. So I would work during, I'll go to school during the day and then I'll work at night. But then from a dishwasher, I started to make my way up. I went to a, a line cook and um, I got overworking in the back. So I wanted to be in the front. So then I went to be a waiter and I ended up becoming a bartender. So I was got to the point where I was in my mind, learning and healing people during the day and then providing them alcohol and poison and, and the opposite effect at night. And I did that for a while and it was such an oxymoron <laughs> to my life. And I felt so like, I can't do this. Um, I, I just ended up quitting Bubba Gums with no backup plan. My backup plan, because I was in Lomi school, um, the whole idea was one day, once I get my license, I'm going to be able to make money doing this. Um, that never came to fruition, but that was my plan the plan that never came to be. And um, during that time, though, it really started to push my faith that everything was going to be okay. Um, but then the issue came about where I was becoming so passionate and I didn't know why and I didn't know what to do with it, but become so passionate about Hawaiian culture. I, I, I still continued to dance. And I started to dance with Kumuchiki Mohoi back here at home. Um, I started to do Lomi Lomi and I was learning under Kono Suza at that school and then started to learn under him, you know, 
after that because the school didn't come to fruition. I, I ended up not completing it. But during that time as well, then I started to sit in classes at UH, if it was La'au Lapa'au. Um, and then I started to take some, just then other programs and opportunities started to become um, of awareness for me. So then I started to take, like I, I started to learn Kappa um, under Auntie Aia Ibello. I started to learn under some of my friends how to ulana and weave. Um, and there's just so many different opportunities that I would just milk and, and soak in like a sponge. And while on the same time, I'm living at home, I'm not paying rent. My parents was like, okay, you will do this at the same time. And I'm not making any money doing any of this. I'm spending money to take these classes. Um, my Lomi Lomi job didn't work out, but I was still doing Lomi as much as I could, just kind of on my own, but it was all barter. So um, I, I couldn't charge anybody because I didn't get my license. So I would just be like, yeah, just give me whatever. And, you know, I'm hoping that you, you do give me money because I do got to pay rent. Sometimes I'll get, you know, the nice hundred dollar tip. Sometimes it was five dollars. Sometimes it was a plant. Sometimes it was lunch. And it was a way for me as much of, of a stress it was because I didn't know how I was going to make my personal ends meet. Um, but it was just that frustration. Like I have such a passion to do what I'm doing now and just be this student and, and do everything, but it's not giving me the opportunity to make a living off of it. And that was the hard part because I didn't know what to do. I wasn't really, I don't really feel I'm really good at anything specifically. And through this time, it really started to um, build in that sense, because some people were telling me you do too much. You know, some uncles was like, you know, my generation, we, we, we focused on one thing. We became experts in one thing. And you, you're over here dilly-dallying with so much things that's, you know, you need to pick, choose something. You're doing too much. And I'm, I was kind of like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> I wish I had the, the goal or, or the drive to just focus on one thing, but I get really bored after a while. And, and then I lose my interest and, and then my mind starts thinking about something else. So I kind of follow that. So that started to play in the mind too and be like, you know, I don't know. Like, I, I, think my, I, I think my journey is kind of whack because I'm not contributing. You know, I'm not contributing to my family. Um, I'm, they're giving me a couple years to, to do what you need to do to figure it out so then you can pay rent. And that two years came about and I had to continue to not pay rent because I didn't have a job. And anyway, so that, that <laughs> a crazy part of my life kind of took up two years. Um, and through that journey, I, I started to become a, I, I met a lady who became my mentor in, in the business sense, because I started to sketch these designs. And it led me to create a brand called Na'au Valao Designs. But it all stemmed from just really creating these designs. And they're not Hawaiian designs, per se, but they're geometric designs. So they're Hawaiian influenced, I, I would say, tell people. Um, but through these designs, it was my opportunity to kind of showcase what I learned from all these different avenues and opportunities that I've came across and show and share that through a design. Um, and then I, so I started to put that onto different products. And then every time I would do a craft fair, that was the beginning of what I felt like, you know, my journey is crazy. It's not a traditional journey to any extent. Um, but it was the first piece of the puzzle where I had the opportunity to kind of, um, utilize what I was doing and what I was learning and put it into something productive so then I can eventually you know become an adult and do this whole adulting thing which by the way sucks being adult sucks they don't tell you how much it sucks when you're in school <laughs> um, trying to figure this out is a challenge within itself um, but all of that I share all of this because that is really the frustrating basis that I was building not knowing that this opportunity where I stand now came about or, or would come about so anyway, I was doing all these different things, learning a bunch of stuff, and I'm very fortunate for every class that I stepped in um, and had the opportunity to teachers that I was able to learn from. Well, long story short, uh, I ended up getting a job at while doing my, my branding, and I was being this entrepreneur for an, an additional couple of years, and I started to do event planning and just try finding different ways to um, make money for myself. But then when I started to do event planning, I would start to build an event around Ali'i that I have built my knowledge around and, and use that event as a way to honor our, our Ali'i. If it was for the birthday or a significant thing they've done, depending where I, when I was scheduling that event. And then that was just another way of me being able to utilize the information I've built and try to share it that way. 
I didn't make very much money off of it. If anything, I lost money doing that. <laughs> but it, it was through that experience where I started to meet a lot of peers um, and, and other artists and other people that became really close friends and, and built relationships with that I'm starting to see I'm utilizing those relationships now. And I think hopefully as a win-win-win situation, um, I'll, I'll get to that as I get to that part of the story. But just knowing that for me, knowing that every single piece that was a frustrating moment that was those mornings that I woke up getting to a craft fair that I would lose my cool and I would really have a, I would, I would kind of have a breakdown. Like I had many different breakdowns. Like I'm over this. I, I quit. I don't know what I'm doing. This is so frustrating because I just have so much passion and I don't know why. And at some point I hated the fact that I had that passion. There would be moments, not long periods, but in, in that negative space when things just you're questioning and you can't find the answer why where it, for me it became like to the point where i just wish i didn't have this passion i wish i didn't care about hawaiian culture because i don't know what i'm doing and we're built in school to learn and to do all this stuff but then when you get into the real world you don't know how to utilize it and i hear people saying or question why would you go and, and you know get a degree in hawaiian culture in college when the only job you're going to get is a teacher if that other than that you go on hawaiian airlines be a flight attendant or something um and for me, I didn't, I didn't know how to answer that question. But all I knew was there's this feeling in my na'au that it's just, this just gives me warmth and nothing else does. So then if I have to spend my life doing something, I need to figure this out. And fortunately, I give all my credit to Akuo because um, the, I look back at all those different things and I, it, you know, it, it just is what it is. Um, and and I, give, I give mahalo mahalo to him. Anyways, before I go off topic, I ended up meeting, uh, I ended up getting a job at um, Native Hawaiian Hospitality Association, which is a nonprofit organization that's kind of like the cultural component of Hawaii Tourism Authority. And fortunately, I was, that was my first job in a few years ever since leaving Bubba Gumps as, as a bartender was my last job. And I felt super honored because it, it was an opportunity of really engaging the visitors. And I've always felt, you know, coming from the younger younger me that was kind of like um you know, this is just just sharing you know screw screw how to people that was in my mind as a kid that that kind of was the, the angry inside me and that has completely changed now because um you know i i see that there's a space when you're it's appropriate to be angry and but it's not a space to remain angry and for me it was always just how do i use that anger and frustration as a fuel to change that and when I got into the tourism industry, it was that opportunity to really uh, learn both ways, I feel. You know, I didn't want to be the one to point fingers and be the angry and, and just yell at everybody. I felt like, you know, we have enough people who do that. <laughs> I just want to find an avenue where I could build a bridge between the visitors and our own people so then that we could, you know, be those storytellers again, and then we could successfully get that across. And through that time, my main kuleana, I forget what my title was, but my main, one of my main kuleana during that job was social media. And I ended up getting to a point where I created um, a, a theme for a post every single day of the week so we can keep the social media up. And I, when we got to Wednesday, I don't know how it came about, but I just remember driving down the street one day and then I look up at the street sign and I was just wondering, like, who is this? Who is this? Like, what does that mean? So then come down when I'm planning out all, all the, the themes for the week, I come to Wednesday. And I just remember, like, who that? What that? Who that? What that Wednesdays? <laughs> so the idea was to go to a street sign, take a picture of the street sign and then just share a little bit about what that name or what that word is or who that is if it's a name you know and that is how um i started in terms of kind of sharing cultural knowledge through social media and then once that job came to an end for me um those were just like picture posts so i figure on my own when i again i didn't have a job at that point because i was um i was getting back to being more of the entrepreneur side of it but I started to take those picture posts that I was doing during that time. And then I just elaborated more into, I figured, you know, what, let's, let's make videos because everybody's on social media. I'm not, I want to be relevant. <laughs> How do I make culture relevant with everybody else out there? And I felt like, you know, pictures, you can only go so far. So what's the next step? And it was videos. Um, but in my mind, it's how do I make Hawaiian culture popular? 
you know, how do we make people care about Hawaiian culture as much as I feel like I care about it to the point where sometimes I'm just over it because I feel, you know, anyway. Um, so I ended up to do, I figured let's just make one minute videos because I know at the times on Instagram, you can record up to a one minute video to post. So then my first video ever that I did was Kapi'olani Boulevard, um, right across the street from Alawai Park. There was, I, there was a sign there and I did it right there. And I remember buses passing by me. There's a few people who would pass by me. I'm literally standing on the corner <laughs> and there's these random people passing by. I stop and I feel so weird. And this is just, this is weird. But I, I, I started and I would do it and it, it grew in terms of its traffic, you know, slowly by slowly. And then what I ended up doing was making a website and building a, a simple website. And I would just post these videos on there, kind of like a portfolio, not really knowing what I'm doing. My business mentor at the time, she was the one kind of leading me to do this. So I was just following her command. <laughs> um, you know, like all Kumus tell you, you do this, you go. <laughs> um, so anyway, I ended up doing that. And then uh, eventually came around Halloween of 2017. And one of my friends that I used to work with at Bubba Gums, he sent me a text with this video of this Hawaiian boy come to find out who was graffitiing the statue of Prince Kuhil down in Waikiki with this bright orange construction spray paint. And he sent it to me and it was like his friend who was recording his friend. So he was there for one. You can see him going on and he was explaining that um, Hawaiians lost Waikiki. So there's no point or something like that. And it just, I, when he sent it to me, he just told me, I know how much, you know, you love this stuff and you love Hawaiian culture. Just do what you want to do with this video. Just don't mention my name. So I was like, okay, fine. So I took that video, which really, it, it was very disheartening because come to find out as a Hawaiian boy, he was from like Waianae or something. And it's just like, and the fact that you feel that we lost Waikiki to, to visitors and to the visitor industry that you don't give crap anymore and that you're just going to vandalize, like that doesn't make any sense to me. So instead of being the angry Hawaiian that I could have easily been, I, for some reason, again, I, I just give credit to Akua because if I were to do that now, I probably wouldn't have done this, but I just went onto the web, um, internet and grabbed all the emails I can find from every single news station, from the general manager to the other email that I didn't even know who it was. I just put every single email I could find and I put it onto an email and I grabbed that video and I grabbed my website link that I just started to build some of these street videos and I sent it to all the stations. And I just said that, you know, I feel that if there's cultural education integrated within the newscasts, that situations like this may not have happened because, and it would be a win-win-win situation. This, this boy probably would have, you know, let's just say you share education on the newscast this boy may have known who Prince Kuhi was and and how he's benefited from uh, the legacy of Prince Kuhi and how we still are benefited from him today and would have had the respect and the aloha and would not have vandalized him. So that would have been a win for the community because they are learning stuff for free. And I think learning about ourselves now comes with a cost a lot of the times and there's not much opportunities that you get free chances to learn on a... Um, you know, uh, accurate sense, at an accurate sense. So it's a win for him. It's a win for the station because I felt then that the community looking at that station of providing and giving the time to share culture education, the community is going to look at you and they're going to start to build more of appreciation for you. So it's a win for the station. And then it's a win for me because I needed a job. <laughs> Didn't know what I was going to do, but it, I just, maybe this could start something. And KHON2 was there's another station who responded. I forget I, I forget which station it was, but they responded and they said, this is a great idea, but we're just not looking for this right now. KHON was the one who said, this is a great idea. You should come in and talk story. So that was October. And November, I go in and I meet with the first time ever in a news station walking around. And I went into this one office and I just figured that this must be the boss lady because she has the only office in this station <laughs> that I could see. And it was a big office. So I figured like, oh, she kind of has some clout. Um, not really knowing who she was, come to find out she was a news director. And we talked story and it just so happened, again, something I, I would have never known, but that, that station had just started a morning newscast. And then um, they just started this, this second segment of the newscast, which is called Take Two. And it follows the morning news. And it's just an additional hour of news, but more in a, in a, a fun light. So as it was still new, they're still building it. And just so happened... Um, they agreed to have these street segments like I was building on the website to be integrated within that brand new 
um, program. And it started off to be once a week, I would do it. And it was starting in January of 2018. So I was so stoked and it was all a volunteer basis. I didn't get hired or anything at the time. And it was through January through March or, or so that I was doing this every week, voluntarily waking up. I'm not a morning person, so I have to get up at seven o'clock to be down there by eight. And then my segment came in at like seven, eight, eight thirty or something. And it was like a four minute segment and it was pretty cool, you know, and it was, it started off with knowledge that I knew. And then I realized like, you know, all that crying, all that complaining, all that wondering, what am I doing with my life is starting to become more clear to me. Like now I have an opportunity to take what I've learned and all this passion and put it to something in good use. And lo and behold, it's in front of the entire state. I first was never really comfortable on the camera. So that was a whole journey within itself. But then I think I was just so overwhelmed with this chance to be able to edu to, to share what I learned. Um, really didn't make the, the, the talking ability a big problem, which I, I still do <laughs> have a talking ability or, or disability, I, I feel. Um, but I, through that journey, anyway, before I get off topic again, um, from January to around March, beginning of March or so, I, I got pulled into the office and I felt like, oh no, like I must have said something. Cause I remember, I think the last segment I did at that time was uh, Lili Uokalani Avenue in Waikiki and Pawa Kalani Avenue in Waikiki. And Pawa Kalani was the name of Queen Lili Uokalani's estate that is right there on that street. And that's the, um, from what I was told, that was, the the garden of uh, the, the state where she had a garden that she would take care of and some of the flowers from that garden was used um, as the flowers that was given to her when she was in prison wrapped around all the newspaper telling her of what was taking place outside of her imprisonment so there was all those stories that I was sharing and then of course when you talk about Queen Lilu Kalani you you have to talk about the overthrow and I had said in my stuff that you know the Hawaiian government was illegally overthrown by American and European businessmen. And then I get this phone call that I got called into the office. And I'm like, oh no, maybe I shouldn't have said that, you know. But then for me came a thing like, you know, I I feel there's a lot of things in our history that growing up in school, um, learning throughout elementary, intermediate, high school, that we're taught so much but to a certain extent, and then they kind of like hold back the things that are sensitive um, or we just touch upon it a little bit and we don't elaborate too much about it or just in conversations with people, people don't want to hear about the overthrow. They don't want to hear about things that go against America or some, you know, that kind of jazz. And for me, it's, it, it was never an approach to bastardize or to point fingers or to, you know, complain against the American government at that time or whatever. That's that could be easily the angry person of me, but that was never my intent with these videos. It was more of this is the facts. This is what not doesn't necessarily be spoken about. And I also feel this is the things that people want to hear. Like you want to know about Hawaii, you have to talk about the goods and the bads. So I felt like I needed to share that within these segments. Well, I get pulled into the office thinking I'm going to get fired or or let go and be like, sorry, you can't talk about that stuff. You you have to um, we're going to, we're going to stop you. But she ended up off, my, my boss ended up offering me or, or recommending for me to apply for the weather job that came about because the weather um, position for the weekend had become vacant come April. So she had uh, recommended that I apply for this because she felt, I don't know, just how, however I am, that it would be a good chance. So I did two months or so, a month and a half went by and I didn't hear anything. And then come beginning of April, I, I got the, I got the, or somewhere around there, I got the, the notice that I got the job. So come April 16th was my first day of employment at KHON as the weekend weather person. And then three days a week, I started in the morning news. And that was a whole challenge within itself because I would work on the weekends at night. And then I would work uh, thir Wednesday, Thursday, Friday in the morning. I start at work at three o'clock in the morning, go to 11 o'clock at night. And then my weekend was three o'clock in the afternoon to 11 o'clock at night. Um, it was just on the opposite side of the cat of, of the day. So it was really hard, but that was, I was still doing my, my Aloha authentic segments. So it was just now just adding on top. And even now to this day, it just keeps building. When I first started, one of the, the, the morning cameraman, he's like, 
you know, maybe you shouldn't do a good job because they're only going to keep telling you to do more. So just do a little bit of a job and then just, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. So they don't keep asking you to do more stuff. And I'm thinking, you know, you're a brilliant man. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, I want to make as much use out of this as I can. So with all of that and with the new weather position, it during that process of training, um, talking about how to talk about weather. I'm not a weather person. The most I knew about weather was I can tell you if it's raining right now or if it's not. Like that was my knowledge. So I had to build a lot of knowledge to get to being able to speak and just telling the story of the weather. But then uh, that's not me. You know, I mean, I, I can do that. But what can I do to to enhance this? So there were just little things like once I was I started to we build our own slides. So whatever you see on the screen, we build that. And then that's what's shown. So I would build a slide and start to make things more a little personal for me. And then throughout the training process, I started to put the Hawaiian words it's like, you know, let's, let's, let's just try this. If we're going to say winds, let's, let's put the Hawaiian word or um, little things like that. So I, I do have um, some slides to share. So I'm not really good at this. I'm hoping this goes smoothly, but I have some slides for those who may not be familiar. Um, I wanted to share a few slides of what I've done. So something as just as simple like this, um, English word, Hawaiian word, and it, it's little things. And sometimes, you know, when we talk about it, I sometimes I try to bring attention to it and share like, you know, our makani or in Hawaiian, we say makani in English, it's winds. Or sometimes it's just if it's I don't get the chance to, to bring attention to it, at least it's there and people can see. Um, but it's just something simple like that. And then I have a few other ones, excuse me for my um, ugly computer. But then I had like low temperatures and it, it, then you can kind of become a little bit more conversational as the more I've done this, the more I realized like, you know, like anu anu. But then when these temperatures get down into the 50s, sometimes, you know, we say hoogie hoogie when it's freezing. So then I can change this or it just gives opportunities as I'm talking to, you know, be educational rather than just informing. And I think it's those little things that for me, I enjoy. And that's why I would, I, I, I've done it and I continue to do it um, because it's also, I, I need to be refreshed on things that I, I know. Um, and then another one that I have is even on the bottom. So one thing when I, when I did all this training, I put things together. The last thing I had to do was show it to my boss and have her be okay with what I have before I went on air and I, before I went live. And the one thing she told me, she loved all of this, um, but the one thing she told me was just don't do it too much and expect to get flack. And I, you know, both of those are true. Um, I feel doing too much is, could be very overwhelming. So even like these things on the bottom, this is an, a new screen that we had and I just try to play around with it. But before there, when we first had this slide, the, the Hawaiian words and those white boxes weren't there. It was just the blue. So it's, I felt like, by putting these Hawaiian words there is, it's not making this slide too complicated. You know, when you have these slides, you don't wanna have too much words. You don't have too much graphics, too much things going on because you want it to be easily understood. And you want your message of the weather, which is my primary goal within this job, is to get the weather message across that does still comes across successfully, but hopefully by a little flare of Hawaiian stuff like this, people will be able to become more um, aware of it is the first thing, become more familiar with it is the second. And hopefully for me is that you're so familiar and inspired and you love this, that it inspires you to go and find out more on your own. And so it, all of this is just like a little, just like little, you know, sugar on the, on the top of, of whatever you or little, you know, a little garnish that you add to just give it a little perfect and a cherry on top. Um, so these are little things I do within the weather. And it's, again, it's just not on the screen but it's as I'm talking. And for me, I'm really bad at talking. I'm really bad at English, first and foremost. <laughs> like I'm not an English fluent. I'm not fluent in English. I'm not fluent in Hawaiian. And that's kind of one of the reasons why I wanted to start off this thing with that little, um, the little funny chant that I did with, I, I didn't know Hawaiian um, fluently, never did. I, I went in high school up to Hawaiian for I think by just like a thread. I went back into college. I started off with Hawaiian one again, went up to Hawaiian three, um, failed Hawaiian three, my, my junior year in college. I had to retake it my senior year. I was failing again. So I ended up dropping it. 
And when I went into college, I actually went in with wine studies degree. I double majored with political science. And then I ended up graduating with political science because I couldn't finish wine language. I couldn't pass the make it or break it year. Um, so when I get to this, it kind of sets me up because now people are asking me, how do I translate this? How do I say this? Can you can you do a whole story in Hawaiian? Can you speak to me in Hawaiian? And I'm like, I don't, I don't, I'm not fluent. <laughs> like I can do a little things, like I can do Hawaiian 101, these kind of things. Um, so I, I just, I, I think that's just kind of funny that I set myself up for failure for that. But it's something I've always wanted to get back to. And I want to do get back to um, trying to learn how to speak more fluent Hawaiian and be more progressive in that. Um, so it, it's stuff like this. And then one other thing that I, I did when I put all these slides together, it was the moon phase. And this one, when I first put it, now this, okay, for the moon phases, I never knew the moon phases to this day. I'm just, I'm, get, I'm catching on a little by little when I can, you know, in terms of memorizing it. But I just know that there's a lot of resources through my journeys of, of the different classes and courses I took and people I've met. I've just built my knowledge and awareness of different resources that are out there. So with this, my goal is to share those resources. It's not necessarily to teach. I don't consider myself a teacher. I just, I'm always a student learning. And I just feel like, Maya Angelou says, I forget what her exact quote is, but when you learn, teach. And I just feel like if I share, because this is interesting to me, other people may think it's interesting out there as well. Um, so I, I knew the resources of where to find the Hawaiian moon phases. And it, it's so copacetic with, with weather. It's like the perfect addition and nobody else is doing it. Um, so I had put this together and I had proposed that to my boss and she loved it. And it just tripped me out like, wow, man, I... I to getting to putting all this up, there really wasn't for me too much flack when it came from the station. And I gotta say, as as KHON, everybody thinks it's Fox, and that Fox would be the the, the last station to agree to do something like this, um, which it it's a Fox affiliate, just FY. So it's not necessarily Fox, but I just feel like with the station being so open to do this, like I, that, I'm going to just milk it. I'm going to milk this cow and see how far I can go. She gave me the green light, so I'm going to go with it. So fortunately, we continue to do this now. And then if you can see, there's that Oahu Pain um, logo underneath the name. Well, that means it's sponsored. So now we've gotten to the point where companies are people are appreciating this so much where companies are paying and investing their money into the station to sponsor this meaning that i have to share this so every single week and every saturday and sunday the moon phases have to be aired on the newscast because it's already paid for so it's gotten to the point where the the the, the want i believe of this type of knowledge or at least to put it out there so people can become more aware or you know if they've never known this now they want to try or you know little things like that where it's built that that want and i've just felt like so like wow this is so cool um so this is something that we do now and i i very this is something i can do so i'm appreciative when people are like oh what's tonight's moon phase i'm like wait wait give me a second i need to look at the calendar first like i don't know on the top of my mind um but hopefully you know this is something that we can continue to to build on too i don't know how you know it's it's kind of a um you learn from what doesn't work and what works and you just kind of build as you go so fortunately, this has kind of, it all worked out well, and it continues to this day, and I'm very fortunate of that. So once this started and I got into the station, this is like, the weather is is the number one reason why people tune into the news. So first and foremost, I got this this email from, a, from my news director one day, sending it to all of us, just giving us some statistics in terms of viewers watching the news and what they tune in for. I believe it was... Weather was on the top of the list. I think it was like 70% of people tune in for weather. That's the, the, the number one thing people tune into the news for. And then it's, of course, top news, local news, national news, sports, and whatever else comes after that. So when I got that, I'm like, okay, I'm a newbie in this station. I'm a newbie in the news industry. I'm a newbie in front of the camera. I'm always behind. I'm never was comfortable with the way that I sounded. I was never really was confident in my, my self-image and all these weaknesses that I felt I had, I'm just starting to realize like now I'm really utilizing those weaknesses as strengths, as, as my strengths or as tools for me to kind of build my career, which I just trip out on because if I would have thought I did this in high school, I, would, I wouldn't have thought. Uh, in high school, I did do a little morning news thing, but it wasn't anything serious that I was going to you know, become a news person. So it just kind of trips me out. And again, I give credit to Akua for 
um, for guiding me along this crazy journey. But with the weather, this is kind of how, fortunately, I kind of, I think, built the biggest awareness of myself within our community was through the weather. And even Justin Cruz, who's, who is my trainer, you know, he trained me, he's our main weather person. Um, he even said that the weather is where people will, will recognize you and, and will um, get to know you better. The, the street segments that I do, not as much traffic, you know, people don't necessarily tune in for that. So then for me, it's like, okay, well, the ball's in my court when it comes to this education, you know, and, and I want to make sure I can um, continue this, but then how can I strengthen my, sh my segments? Like weather is, is weather, you know, you can only go so far without being too overwhelming. Again, my boss said, don't, don't go too much. And I agree with that. You know, even if it's in business, people had, someone had just asked me recently, um, naming a, naming a company, because my company name is Na'al Vala'al Designs. Um, is it is it good to name a company a Hawaiian name or is it better if we give it an English name? And for me, it kind of tangents with this. Like I feel, and the more I've been in this space uh, out from the Hawaiian community space that like I was so ma with, um, it's kind of changed my perspective a little bit. I don't feel it has changed me. I think it has kind of evolved my perspective. And before I was at, let's go to Albala Al Designs. Everybody's going to speak Hawaiian. You got to say it my way. I want to go so Kua and and as hard of a, you know the Hawaiian approach as possible, but then now I kind of see that by doing so, it, it becomes intimidating for a lot of people, especially for me. Again, my my demographic that I always wanted to impact the, the most was our visitors, because again, I want the story of our home around the globe to be the stories that we share here and how we share it here. Um, but at the same time, I felt like if if I do it genuine to my culture and to who I am and to what I believe while the tourists are my demographic the way that I set these stories up it's going to impact our own local people nonetheless because hopefully I do it justice the way I set it up it, it connects with our local people but I want to not necessarily dumb it down but keep it so simplified where it's not overwhelming and it's not intimidating um, for people who don't know this stuff and a lot of it is our own visitors a lot of on the flip side though there are I'm coming to find out a lot more local people um, who don't know this stuff as well. And I know that because they come up to me and they tell me that. And like, no, I didn't know this. I, I heard about this as a little kid, but I haven't, you know, I stopped learning a, a long time ago. And for, for me to see it now, it brings back all these memories or those kind of things also warm my heart. Like, wow, I, I am really engaging with the local people. But again, that's not my, my focus, but I'm so fortunate that it's like a two bird, one stone kind of a thing. Um, but going back to being intimidating, I know what it feels to step into a conference where you have a high wig, people, you know, high uh, people in our community that people look up to. It makes me very nervous. So when people are talking fluent Hawaiian and I can't keep up and I get intimidated, like, oh, man, I, I get nervous. I kind of want to leave and I feel ashamed, you know, so it prevents me from going all in, you know, or it, it, it prevents me from speaking up and asking questions and so forth. So for me, I always felt like, you know, from coming from that, we're going to do Na'al Vala Al Designs, we're going to speak Hawaiian, I kind of shifted it more to maybe we should name this something simple. You know, maybe we should give it more of a, sim a, a simp simple approach. When I built my event planning company, um, I ended up just calling it Native Hawaiian Expo, like something so simple where then it, it doesn't tune people out because I think once you make something so complicated, once people who don't know especially our visitors, they, they want to know, but they don't want to feel ashamed that they're not going to do it. You know, that's what prevents them. So for me, of keeping these things so simple, not being so overwhelming, following what my boss says, I don't do too much. I agree with that now like this. And it's only the foundation. So hopefully, maybe the more we go, the more we add to it, the more layers we can build. Um, but I think for, for the weather side and in the news, it's a very slow process. Um, People always ask me, you know, you should correct so-and-so because he speaks these words or, or she speaks these words wrong or they're not pronouncing this name correctly or, or so forth. You need to correct this person. You need to correct that person. Um, when I got into this, I was like, yeah, I'm going to tell this person this. I'm going to tell them they're going to have to say it this way or whatever. But then I, 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 I don't really do that. I got to admit, I kind of, I, I feel like first and foremost, I need to get my stuff down. And if I do what I do well, if I pronounce names correctly, if I do justice in all these different things that I'm, I'm trying to create and people see me, then maybe they'll follow. You know, maybe they'll ask me why I said it this way rather than the way that they said it. And that's kind of what's happening now. A lot more in frequent days and weeks and months do I get called or texts of 
from other reporters and anchors, how do you pronounce this word? How do you say this? I want to get this correct. And I felt like if I were to go up to people and point my finger and tell you this, 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 one, I feel kind of weird doing that because I, I'm the young buck in the station and, you know, I'm not a teacher, I'm not fluent and I have my own faults So going up and telling somebody else they have faults, I was not, not comfortable, especially if it's Joe Moore, <laughs> you know, or for, especially if it's the high big wings, I can't do that. Um, but I felt that if, you know, we, we just, we, we start slow and this was a slow thing. But the other thing kind of going back to the segments is in, in recent months i've kind of been uh sharing well every month what i do okay i'm going i'm kind of getting thrown off so i'm going to just collect myself and i want to share the video of what i'm talking about first if you've never watched a, a a street segment this is one street segment that i have done just to kind of paint you a picture and then i will explain after in the Ahupua'a okay. of Paunau, which lies in the moku of Lahaina, on the island of Maui, stands a street given the name that means house or building. We're talking about Hale Street. As it remains Hawaiian Language Month, one way to start learning Hawaiian words is by beginning at home. In old Hawaii, kukui nuts were used to make a candle for light. So when you turn on your lights, you turn on the kukui. The word noho used as a noun refers to a chair. When you say noho as a verb, however, it means to sit, reside, or occupy. Some words are a literal Hawaiianization of English words. For example, when you watch TV, you're watching the key V. The word pahuhau literally means icebox, referring to the refrigerator. But when saying freezer, you say pahupa'ahau, or solid icebox. As you cook in an oven, you're using the oma. When on the stovetop, you're using the kapuahi. And when you want to nuke your dish fast, you use the microwave or oma vave, literally meaning fast oven. As you look out the window, you're looking through the puka niani, the word puka meaning hole and the word aniani referring to glass. And when you throw away your trash or opala, you throw it in a kini opala, which translates as rubbish can. Did you know? Now you do. Yeah. Okay. Stop share. <laughs> so that's kind of how, you know, um, so I started with weather and then this is still continuing to go. Weather you only can go so far. With these street segments, though, this is where I really feel like I can dive a little deeper and don't have to be so um, shallow in, in my, my presentation. But it, especially when it comes to February, because I started to theme every month to give me a little bit more of an ed, ed organization when I do these stories. Um, but then I, I started to use February because it's Olelo, uh, Mahino Olelo Hawaii, but then I, I kind of just do it randomly as well. But then taking these opportunities to kind of share vocabulary some of these stories would be like you know mo'olelo on our elite or you know kalakaua avenue i would spend that to talk about king david kalakaua um but then when we come to these this opportunity to kind of share vocabulary in recent weeks i've also shared um proper pronunciation to street names proper pronunciation to place names and then using that then as the way to be able to correct you know um, and not necessarily go up to people and say, you're wrong, you need to do it this way. But I felt like this is a, a, an aloha approach. And I don't, you know, I just felt like it's the best way for me. So this is kind of the way that I do it. And this is the way that, I, again, I still keep these videos to one minute to today. Um, I feel it's just, it's a short amount of time before you, once you get to one minute and five seconds, I feel you start to lose a lot of people's attention. <laughs> so keep it short and sweet. And again, the goal of this is once we end this, I want to know more. You know, so hopefully people are asking themselves or telling themselves that and either tuning into the next week or better yet, that they go out and grab a dictionary, have that at least build it as a resource. You know, it may not be something to read every day, but then you grab a dictionary so then you can say you have it. So when you do have questions, what is this? What is that? Go in and find it for yourself because you only can, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, rely on other people for so much. And then you need to start to, you know, become your own resource so hopefully if it's not dictionary go out and learn more about the streets around your own home and that's why on my website i started to kind of like build a map of different islands and the streets that i've done and kind of geo place them is that like the, the technical term like put a little dot on where the street is so then hopefully 
people who are tuning in, they can, or, you know, they go on the website, and engage with, they can find like where I live and if there's any streets that's been done around their home. So then hopefully if you want to start to learn and be inspired, start at home. That's probably the most relatable you can be rather than learning on a street on somebody else's island. If, if there, if I haven't done, you know, then I started to, how, again, how can we kind of inspire this and make Hawaiian culture and Hawaiian stories popular? I think a couple of times I put out there, like, you know, tell me I haven't done the street in front of your house make a little video and, and share with me a, a little bit of the mo'olelo of the name of your street. You know, so it's those kind of things that I feel that um, is one step to, to do that and to maybe not normalize it necessarily just on TV, but how do we normalize Hawaiian culture and Hawaiian language within ourselves? Because we all live in Hawaii. For those who visit Hawaii, you're visiting here for a particular reason. If it is just the beauty that you see here for your visitor destination experience, or if it's because, or if it's a, you know, if you're a returning visitor that are come are returning back to Hawaii and you see Waikiki the exact same and are starting to realize that I think there's more to Hawaiian culture. Like, where can I find more authentic culture rather than just the ABC stores that I see on every single corner or on every single street? You know, or if it's just just our own going back to our own local people who are born and raised here who are familiar with some of these things but just don't know and want to know more hopefully these little things can inspire to start at home and that kind of was one of my approaches to continue doing these street segments um <laughs> on the flip side just uh, i not everybody kind of wants their stories to be told at the same time so i you know to bring that into account i did a couple streets in molokai and we all know molokai are very proud Molokai people and they're very protective of their home and I've done a couple and I did get some flack for for doing some stories of Molokai but with that approach I I had it, it gave me the understanding of doing these stories you cannot just go in and do a story a lot of these stories you have to make sure that one of course you know your knowledge and that it's authentic but then it's also about building the relationships with the people who are actually from that space so for when i went to approach molokai i, I went to all my friends that i know are from molokai and i had asked all of them their approach can you make sure my script is okay um or do you even think this would be okay or whatever you know so it, as a person who is building this as a person who interviews people you know these are also little things that i wasn't aware of before but then you start to and more so i think part of when you're talking about stories it's also the respect that you have it's not just telling a story because you want to tell a story but it's telling a story because i for me i have that passion and love that i want to perpetuate this but i also want this to hopefully you know um lead to another story that i could find and 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 yeah so anyway, so there's that, but I, I'm trying to tangent to my last part of Aloha Authentic. So with these stories, um, th this is under this brand that I called Aloha Authentic. And Aloha Authentic is a, just another thing that I had created during those years of trying to be an entrepreneur and doing my own thing. Um, when I first started Aloha Authentic, it was a, a program that we wanted to start that was built around Hawaii artisans as a, as a means of me being an entrepreneur at the time and I had the Alba Lao designs. It was a platform where we can bring on artists to bring awareness to their brands and have them share their story. And it was a program that we started at, with the association that I was a part of this um, artist association at the time that we started at with Olelo Community Media, which is the community television here on Oahu. And I started to um, go to King Intermediate School and do my shows there and that really came off and was based off of doing a craft fair with Na'au Vala'au where the, I was sharing stories of all my designs and products and this lady approached me and she asked would you want to share these stories on tv she was from Olelo and I ended up just like oh yeah I'm down to try everything once so I tried and it just the ball just kept going and that's how that had started um but then once it started to kind of bring in more of the cultural aspect not necessarily artists but more kupuna you know the idea was not just to um, hear the stories of our kupuna, but also archive their voices. And this was an opportunity to do so. Um, so we did that. And it was just something, again, I wasn't working at the time. This was something I was doing once a month. And it was free for the most part. Anybody can kind of have their own program. If you don't have somebody who comes with you and you need somebody to like man all the operating systems and stuff, the staff of Olalo can do it, but then it's a $50 charge. So then I ended up paying money and losing out money on doing 38 or 39 episodes, I think I've done throughout three seasons with Olelo. And it was this very raw 
30 minute conversations, no commercials, no graphics, nothing to spice it up. They were just talking heads the whole time. And now I can kind of see how boring that could have been um, for people who are watching that you're just watching talking heads for 30 minutes. But I felt the the engagement with that had really actually increased. And I only found out from word of mouth, I will walk down and people approach me and talk to me that they've seen the show and stuff. And it was very inspiring for the the, the few that, that came up and, and shared their experience watching the show with me. And it just inspired me to keep doing it. I didn't know why I was doing it. I was losing out money. I didn't have a job. My mom was even telling me like, you know, you should just finish this or you just stop it. There's no point in doing this. And I felt like, you know, I agree there at some point feel like there is no point, but I'm going to just continue to do it. Fast forward to I'm working at KHON. I was still doing these Olelo shows. And after about nearly a year after working, um, starting with this job, I was working in the morning again. We ended up buying out the K5 channel, which was on the channel five here on Oahu. And then they created this whole K-High channel. And that's where that came about. And now it's a sister station to us. So we like broadcast off of the two. Well, when that came about and it, it created this whole new broad, uh, newscast during the evening that then they moved me from the morning to the evening. And I continued to do the weather on the weekends, but now I'm working at nighttime during the weekdays as well. So I don't have that really screwed up schedule. Um, but with that, they were looking for local programs to fill out this one hour broadcast or to fill out the, the newscast and the channel itself. So then I, it was just off of a whim. And I, I originally told myself, I'm not going to pitch this Aloha Authentic show until my contract came up, which was two years into, uh, you know, two years was, a, was my contract. But this was only about eight, nine months or so. So when they told me, I just kind of went off of a whim, just as I did emailing every single new uh, email address I could find. And I approached my general manager and I showed her just a few clips that I did with Olelo. And I just said, you know, we, I have this already. And it would be a great opportunity if we can kind of um, really just add to this and bring it to the station, but then add and make it better. And the, the manager agreed, my boss agreed. And that kind of is how then Aloha Authentic came to KHON. And we're now closing off the second season. We have one more episode to go that we will be filming in a couple months or so next month. Um, and then I'm already starting to plan our third season. And so every season has 12 episodes. So we're already almost 24 episodes in um, throughout the time that I've been here. And then we're, we're going to step into the next 12. And with that, I mean, with this whole Aloha Authentic show now, it's, it's a whole different ball game when it comes into working with a news station there's so many different people in the news station that you have that are you know moving parts and the one thing i appreciate about this job is that everybody has their kuleana and i had my last job my boss would literally stand over me typing watching what i'm typing on the computer and i was just like what the heck this job i don't never see my boss <laughs> like everybody has the trust for each other that you're going to do your job because if you don't, I can't do mine. And if I can't do mine, then there's going to no, there's not going to be a newscast tonight. So I love the fact that we all have kind of our own thing. We all kind of are, our, our heads are in our own desks and we're doing our thing. Um, so with this new job, with this new show, then I had to start working with other departments, you know, the sales department, because they're the ones who sell it like the, the Oahu Payne sponsorship for the moon phase marketing, who does all a whole different side. And, so it, it's really brought in my perspective of how the news station and industry works. Um, but then comes a lot more challenges that you have to play. Um, before I go off, I do want to share just a, a little clip it from this show. If nobody's ever seen Aloha Authentic, this one um, with this show. So how, from going from an artist's perspective to a little bit of a culture when we were at Olelo, when we brought it to KHON, for me, the whole point is to just continue mainly that same goal, sharing different perspectives of Hawaiian culture through our own people and allow our stories to be told that way. So this particular one is from Auntie Kalei Nuuhiva. I had the blessing to fly to Maui um, to go meet Auntie Kalei Nuuhiva. For, and for those who don't know, um, she's very acclimated when it comes to weather and Hawaiian knowledge and, and approach to weather. So that was the whole theme about this particular episode. And this one, she's sharing a little bit about the moon. So I, I wanna, hopefully this works on the first, on the first shot. <laughs> okay, let me just close this one out first. Okay, share screen. Cross fingers. 
Why is it so important for us to understand how the moon works? Well, that's because the moon's main function is to move liquid. And um, as I was saying earlier, that um, this is knowledge that was brought um, with Hawaiians as they, as they sailed. And when they became Hawaiians, they utilized the season of the moon and the cycles of the moon to determine what are the best days or nights to um, do work uh, mm -hmm. in the most efficient way in the least amount of time. And so I uh, helped them to survive. Again, it comes back to that idea of survivability. Can mm -hmm. you survive here? How can you do that? And how can you do it in, um, in sequence to what the moon is and what it's doing? There are 30 phases that um, Hawaiians recognize. And this is something that you see throughout Oceania, throughout the Pacific. Um, generally, there are 30 of them that we recognize, but they don't correlate to the 24-hour circadian time period. Mm -hmm. it's, so that's a whole different... Um, uh, the Gregorian calendar is more of a solar calendar, and then the Kaulana Mahina, which is the Hawaiian name for the Hawaiian lunar calendar, um, is specifically following the cycle of the moon. And so that's, that's how they differ, and so it was very important for Hawaiians to understand that it sets up the seasons uh, for, um, for your fishing, your farming, uh, governance too, what kinds of things, when do you go to church, when, you know, or, or mm -hmm. temple, or do your religious ceremonies and those things. Um, but like I was saying, the moon's main function is to move liquid, so it'll push liquid or pull liquid, so you have an ebb and, and flow of tide. Uh, it'll and move sap and trees. I was just going to say, and when you say liquid, then you're not just talking about ocean. No, like what not we just think. the ocean. Because, but you see it. You yeah. see the movement of the tides. And if you can imagine, that same activity is happening on freshwater, through freshwater movement, uh, sap, as I was saying, through trees. Uh, also magma, because that's liquid too. So uh, you can actually see uh, the rise and the fall. So even with earthquakes, yeah. there, there's some type of relationship. Correlation. Yeah, wow. absolutely. There's a correlation there. So. So that, that was a little snippet of, of, you know, just one particular show. But in essence, that's the whole point of every of every show is to bring out that cultural knowledge. And I don't know about you, but if I didn't know anything about Hawaiian culture or the Hawaiian moon or whatever, that is super interesting. And I feel like everybody has that interest. Everybody, especially when we're talking about the moon or things that are relatable across the world, but in a Hawaiian perspective, then you get everybody's attention. You know, but then it's it's like it's it's the bait and the chum that you chum the water with to bring in the fish. But then now, how do you catch them? You know, how do you capture and, and you hold them? Then it just becomes all the, the what you then share following that. Um, and I know most of it is really I just try to allow everybody else to talk. But at the same time, when I'm doing this, I, I don't want to come across as being an interviewer or, you know, I don't feel that I I don't feel like I belong <laughs> in, in the sense like my, my fleshly abilities. I just feel like it, I, I shouldn't be in this position again. I, I, so I only give credit to Akua for getting me here because um, the way that I talk, I, I feel like I have a hard time keeping conversation, but when I'm in this space, I feel like I'm just such a, I'm a 16 year old boy who's just so giddy and I just want to learn. And I just, then I, I, I want that then to come across as well, because I feel when that authenticity in the conversation comes across through the screen, then for the viewers, it's not like they're watching an interview. My whole hopes is that they're just kind of like part of the conversation, but they, we, we just can't hear them, <laughs> you know, but at the same time, then it's inspiring them to like, call on the Mahina. Okay. I want to go and find out more about that. And that's actually one thing too, is how do we make this the most educational? So that's why I had insisted that we put subtitles. Every time we have a Hawaiian word, I want a subtitle there unless it's already said, and then we're saying it multiple times after. But the first time we say th something, anything Hawaiian, I want everybody to know exactly what we're talking about. If, we don't, if we're not translating it, at least it's, it's visually there. So it's little things, and it may seem super simple, which it is, but it's that little simple act that I think people remember. And, and that's the thing that makes them feel part of it. Like, again, going back to being unintimidating, I feel if we didn't have subtitles, if we didn't speak so basic it, it then becomes a little bit more and that could i don't know if it would kind of flare people off from wanting to watch or, or have them tune to a different channel you know but if the longer that we can keep people in 
it's you know from a corporate side of course the station industry is like we want ratings which i don't know what the ratings are but from word of mouth and from engagement that i can see off of um social media that it, it only increases and then just from some people who are tuning in from outside of hawaii like i just trip out from the continent to um other countries it's just like wow man you know so even more so how can we now start to find topics to talk about or what topics are there to talk about that we could approach from a cultural perspective um one main one that we've done which i, sh I should have clipped it but i didn't um last season we talked about mahu or homosexuality and it was the first approach to kind of like a human interest story in a sense where everybody understands it but we, i was so grateful that we had kumuhina to be able to be one of the guests and she kind of just so blatantly but so simply uh, so simply put and how explained mahu in a cultural sense you know and i know she has her kapai mahu thing um so it was kind of around that that realm but it was awesome and i it's awesome for me because i felt that was going to be one people are going to hate it or going to love it one or the other there's not going to be a middle ground i didn't get any flack from that particular at least personally through social media and stuff it's been the most engaged video on all my social media platforms the most likes and shares and, and comments and stuff and it, it kind of for me then how do we what's the next step in in this you know we can talk about cultural arts and, and cultural practices but then what about cultural thinking cultural mentality cultural education or you know other things there so that's kind of what i'm trying to get to um but again it partly comes down to my ability to be able to talk about it so then there's there's a balance i have to find but that's kind of where i'm at now and i um i trip out first and foremost but i'm very appreciative because i do see the positive impact that this presence in the news has um given to our community um and i, I don't say that to try to be arrogant or to boast myself but i just feel more so it's about the culture and to see that the culture is is talked about more i don't know if it's now i'm in a space where we have more people talk, that i engage with people more talking about it or if it's the fact that people more so are talking about it or i'm starting to see just more cultural content on news in general and i'm not bringing it back to that it, it stems from aloha authentic i hope i just hope that aloha authentic is part of that but just to see an increase of cultural content cultural knowledge cultural conversations people's wanting to know how to pronounce the the, the right words i'm getting more texts by the days of oh come on how do i pronounce this i want to make sure i say this correctly i think the last one was kenui road there was an incident that happened um on on live you know one of our reporters went live and right before she went live she texted me i didn't know what it was for but then i'm watching her on tv i'm like oh you're doing that for you asked for that like thank you you know people are telling me thank you for telling me this but i'm like no thank you for caring and and i think that's that's all my role really is 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 just to kind of be that resource at least within this particular station that if um one i i represent the community that may have not been represented so much in this industry and with that comes what what we you know admire what we want what we what we're so passionate about but at the same time it's not just passion if um it, it's kind of like knowledge and i think with just the world today there's so much negativity there's so much things that people are you know there's so much problems out there i always felt that I don't know the answer to the problems. I can give you my perspective. A lot of it will probably be based off of emotion. Nonetheless, I always felt the first stepping stone in fixing any issue is education. And that I can do to at least a 101 level. <laughs> you asking for Hawaiian 102, maybe not. I'll have to pass you on to somebody else. But if it's 101, I could I can do that, you know. And I'm just so grateful that this whole conference or this the theme of this particular conversation is normalizing Hawaiian culture on TV and i feel that it it is you know and and i feel that hopefully we're normalizing it not just on TV but in everybody's homes and i feel that everybody we we have people in so much different spaces people are are giving poi bowl uh, you know um poi pounders and poi bowls and their goal is to get that in every single home or you know this type of cultural stuff that everybody's becoming more more influenced with this or we want everybody speaking Hawaiian every everybody's home or I just feel that I'm just so grateful to be a part of that contribution and and the more we have that type of contribution the more our culture will survive I remember in high school one thing that always stuck with me is language is a lifeline to any culture you want to take away a culture you you remove their language you block their language you kill their language 
But on the flip side, it's the opposite effect. The stronger your language is, the stronger your culture is. You find opportunities and find more ways for your community to build, even if it's just a very basic. I mean, everybody's in their in their own level of Hawaiian culture, of Hawaiian language. Again, I'm not fluent. I'm failed Hawaiian language multiple times <laughs> and I continue to do so. But from what I do know, I try to embrace and I and I just would love to be able to continue to add to that. But to know that we're all on our own level. You know, within our health and wellness, we're all on our own level. But I think we all have one main goal, and that's to strengthen and that's to become healthier, that's to become better if it's within our own personal health or if it's within Hawaiian culture, within the language that we speak or the knowledge that we know. I think we all have that one goal. And I think the more that we could, again, from my approach, the more that we can share that outside of Hawaii, the more that we could live Hawaiian outside of Hawaii as well. Um, I'm waiting for the day that I could get Aloha Authentic Street segments, or if it's just the, the show, to other newscasts on the continent. Like we have sister stations in Vegas and whatever. So I had pitched the idea and haven't gotten the green light yet. But how can we make this relevant to Hawaiian people in Las Vegas? You know, and then if we start there, there's many Hawaiian people there. But then, of course, everybody who's not Hawaiian, how can they then relate to this? That to me is a next step. I don't know how to take that yet, but that's one way to take the next step. And I just always think, what is that next step? Um, so with all of that, you know, I, I had written down all these notes. I haven't looked at it once throughout this whole time. <laughs> I know we're coming up to the end of my time. Um, I was thinking like, what is my main message? I'm going to wrap this up with. I have like six different points and I don't know what is the best, but I just feel that um, for me, and I, I, I did an interview yesterday for a, a news story about uh, a canoe festival taking place tomorrow at Kualoa and Hakapu'u, um, the Kualoa Hakapu'u Canoe Festival. I was speaking with Ka'iulani Murphy, who was a navigator, and I was uh, asking her, you know, getting all this set up, uh, what, what's the title that you want me to, to put you down as? Well, she had um, put in an email that she didn't, she didn't want the term navigator because she considers herself a, a lifelong student of navigation. And for me, that's kind of how I approach this is I'm not a teacher. I'm not an expert. Um, I'm not from that generation where the uncle says we, we, we focus on one thing and we become masters of our own art and we share, you know, we didn't dilly dally with a lot of stuff. Well, I'm the one who dilly dallies with a lot of stuff. And it could have seen a lot of negative stuff. But as that student, an everlasting student who just wants to learn and be passionate and and share what I do learn, um, I, I feel that this opportunity within this industry, but also with this conference for you guys listening to me and for me to share my story is that I'm a, I'm approaching this as an everlasting student. Um, so I thank you, Lenny, for saying that because it reminded me of that. And I just want to use that as my closing message that I think when we always think of ourselves as a student, we're always striving to become better. There's always a step forward. There's always a next step. I feel that if we become a master and an expert at something, what's that next step, you know? <laughs> so if we always have that next step forward, that means there's always growth. There means there's always something to learn. And there's always a way that we can always become closer than we are now. So I, I would just, before I ramble on and, and end off on a less important note, I'll end off there. <laughs> Thank you everybody for having me again. And Uluvehi and Kehaulani Mahalo Nui I really appreciate it. Mahalo ya oi e pili. I am so happy to have had this time with you. It has been too long since I have seen you <laughs> and I look forward to that. Thank you to all of you for joining us today and for, for all of your wonderful, wonderful comments in the chat. Maka has not seen them yet. So if you would like to share anything, say manao with him, any questions that maybe we can follow up with you, please put them in the chat. We will share the chat with him later. And, um, he and I will have plenty of time to talk story after. But I do want to say mahalo to you all and mahalo kamaka. Like, aloha authentic. Like, that is you, my dear. Like, I, I really mahalo you saying yes. Taking the dive, being here, and sharing all of your beautiful mana'o. Mahalo, mahalo. Mahalo. Thank you. Before we leave this meeting today, I do have a couple of um, important announcements regarding the summit itself. We have a lunchtime mele after this, um, and you're welcome to join us should you so choose. Um, we also have, we have a wonderful group of, mus of musicians who will provide entertainment during lunch. If you just log back into the main session by using the webinar link and we'll, that we sent you this morning and we'll put it in the chat. The next session, um, 
um, will begin at 12.45 p.m. So you have time, go take a break, stretch those legs, go get out in the sun a bit and come back and join us. We'd love to have you. Mahalo Nui for joining us for this summit. And Keha, would you mind sharing our last slide or two? And thank you guys for your wonderful, wonderful comments. Yes, mahalo, mahalo, nui, e kamapa. Mahalo. <laughs> we do have one question. Do we wanna, um, in the chat? We'll... Maka, do you wanna address it maybe? Yeah, for sure. Okay, if we have a few minutes left. So this question is like, I gotta go up and find it. Have you experienced censors censorship and or limitations to what content you're allowed to share with your Aloha Authentic series? And if so, how do you navigate yourself through that? I am so fortunate that I, for some reason, haven't gotten too much flack at all. And from the station itself, I really didn't get, uh, I can't think of any on top of my mind. Um, the, the most, <laughs> surprisingly, the most flack I've ever gotten were from Hawaiian people. Um, and I would think that it would be from, you know, non-Hawaiian people, because even my boss said, you know, we expect to get some flack. And I just wouldn't have thought it would have been from the, the complaints that came through um, to be that kind. But from the station itself, it's been very open. I, I, it trips me out because, again, I always thought, you know, Fox, too, the Fox station, they're not going to be so open. Um, but when, when I got part of it, knowing that it's an affiliate of Fox, which I still don't really know what affiliate of Fox means. I, it just means we're not Fox. Um, so when people do bring that up, I do have to kind of just point it out that, you know, it, it's not I understand your approach or what you're, you're saying. For me, though, my experience, everything I've done has been very well received with the station. I just had a meeting um, when I was preparing for this next third season, not knowing um, because we haven't really sold, from my knowledge, not much sponsorships. From the first season to the second season, we only had like one low level sponsorship that um, lasted only for a couple months or so. And I had approached my boss to talk uh, to negotiate another contract and I had thrown my, my offer. And one of it was just to spend more time doing the show. And at that time, this was like a year ago or so. And she said, well, we can't have this conversation until the show makes money because we're, they're not going to invest and spend money um, when they don't make money for something. So a year went on and I just had another meeting with her like a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago um, to kind of renegotiate or just to re throw out my offer again. And I had thrown that out. I was like, you know, I haven't seen any sponsorships coming through since then till now. Sponsorships is not my thing. I don't know how to do it. Um, I know once people ask me, they want to help me, I have to go through sales department and they do their whole corporate jazz, which a lot of times I feel it like scares off people because it comes with a big number to pay for. Um, but one thing my boss told me, because I was just fearful that is a third season even to come about. If we don't have sponsorships, are, are we going to invest in, in the next season? And I need to know that now because I need to prepare myself or, you know, figure out how I'm going to walk forward. Well, my boss was saying, despite the fact that you don't see any sponsorships, one, the show's making money, nonetheless. And two, she felt that um, despite the fact if we never get any sponsorships, she's going to continue the show because she sees the importance within the community and the feedback from the community to the station for this. So just to know that I have full support from the station with this show is, is a blessing and I would have never expected it to be so easy in that sense. I mean, it's not easy, but in that particular avenue, it seems so easy. Um, and in terms of the content that I share, I mean, the Mahu and homosexuality episode, I would have thought I wouldn't have been able to do that. But when I had pitched that to the, I had my boss and um, another executive at the time on the table, the response was actually, no, we want you to talk about this. I was like, wait, what? Like, you guys are not making this any easier for me. I mean, any harder for me. This is quite easy. Like, okay, that that's so awesome. So I felt that there I feel right now that there's not, there hasn't been much restriction. Um, but with that, of course, comes the kulian of whatever I do choose that I make sure that I do it right. And I don't, you know, lose the trust in the station because if I were to do a topic, you know, do another show on homosexuality and do it completely wrong and disrespectful or too overboard or whatever, then I could break that trust that I feel I've gained with the station. So, um, no, it hasn't been hard, but then I think the hard part is just making sure, okay, whatever I do next, what is the best approach to do that? And, and, and the hopes that I can execute it. Wow. 
Mahalo, mahalo, mahalo. Mahalo for that great question. Appreciate it. We know we could probably continue to talk story forever. And I would love to give you- I am a Portuguese, so. (laughs) (laughs) And you know you and I will. (laughs) But we invite you guys to also, if you have any more comments and, and questions, please leave them in the chat. We encourage you to go out um, we encourage you to to look into your own personal health, well-being, and cultural practices, and to to take the time. No matter where you are in your journey, it's a journey, and we're all in this to support each other. We invite you back to join us during the lunchtime melee and afterwards at twelve forty-five. Um, until then, I'm going to say ahui ho kako, mahalo for joining us. Mahalo, everybody. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>